right, good morning. Uh, we're broadcasting here today from Fly Chloe in New York City. Okay, good morning. Uh, we're broadcasting today from New York City from the Bai Chloe location on Lafayette Street. My name is Michael Gibson. I'm the Managing Director with U.S. Advisors. And uh, we're ha so happy to be here today to talk about Bai Chloe and the EB-5 investment, uh, the process uh, for getting uh, the investors in here, and most importantly about the site visit. So what we're doing today is a site visit uh, to show the investors who have invested in this store. This store is fully funded. Uh, it was uh, developed by E Squared. We'll have David uh, speak about uh, their development uh, in a short period of time. Uh, but it was then replaced, the capital that they invested was then replaced by EB5 funds. So today what we're doing is a live stream event to show the investors, the attorneys, and their advisors uh, exactly what EV5 went to build and uh, to discuss with David and Samantha uh, a bit more about the concept. Let me begin by saying uh, while we are an investment advisory firm we are not giving investment advice. This is not a sales or solicitation. Uh, this investment has been funded. It is closed so we're not today soliciting or selling any securities. Uh, we're just simply doing our due diligence our ongoing compliance for the investors and we wanted to invite all of you in uh, to watch today. So uh, joining us, uh, David Sellinger with E Squared, uh, Senior Vice President in charge of business uh, development and Sam Samantha Wasser, uh, who is the uh, co-founder -co and uh, we would say president. that the president and the concept behind a lot of what we see today. So uh, David, uh, you've been a guest at many of our live stream events before. Uh, let's begin with you. Let, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you got involved with By Chloe and the, uh, Eastward and, and the role that you play? Sure. So, Michael, great to see you again. Thank you. Great, great to have you in, here in New York. So, um, Chloe started, By Chloe started uh, in July of 2015 with a small store on Bleecker Street. I honestly felt uh, at the time we would do uh, sales somewhere in the range of thirty to forty thousand dollars a week, which would have made it a successful store. And, and our plant-based, vegan, uh, kosher certified model has grown to the point where we're doing somewhere between $110,000 and $120,000 a week just in our small group of students store. So our whole idea behind growing out the model was that we have something that we believe is very scalable, something that we believe is portable, we can take it to new cities, new locations, and uh, because there's a large movement in plant-based diets, uh, we feel we, we have a big success on our hand. So we've planned out now a total of 10 stores that we're going to open by mid-year 2017. Currently we have three stores in New York City, our flagship on Bleecker Street, uh, our 22nd Street store, and this Lafayette Street store. Next to our flagship on Bleecker Street, we opened a bakery sweet by Chloe, which uh, is a 100% vegan uh, bakery. We have a partnership with Whole Foods in Los Angeles in their uh, brand new 365 concept in the Silver Lake section, uh, which we opened in May. And our future developments are line, lining up. We're opening in Boston, in the Seaport area, uh, mid, mid to late February followed by Williamsburg, Brooklyn in early March, followed then by Fenway in Boston in April, Rock Center here in Manhattan probably in May, South Street Seaport here in Manhattan uh, sometime in, in the fall. So we're going to have a total of 11 stores, including the bakery, open by the end of uh, 
September, I forgot to mention also Providence, Rhode Island, across the street from Brown University. And after we opened the first store, um, we decided that, that since we, we have all of the natural requirements for EB-5, for example, this store employs approximately 30 full-time direct employees, as well as another 20 to 25 part-time employees, we wanted to explore EB-5 and, and see if uh, this model fit well to, to an EB-5 offering. Uh, we teamed up with, with Michael and, and brought in some of the more um, popular uh, lawyers, Immigration and, and Securities Council, Homier and Law, uh, Wolfsdorf and Rosenthal, to, to put together an offering memorandum and we thought we'd start with our 22nd Street store. Uh, the 22nd Street store opened in June and uh, we were successful in raising a uh, million dollars for that store from two investors, so we have two $500,000 investors. Total cost on 22nd Street was approximately $1.6 million, so the capital structure looks uh, as such. We have $600,000 invested into that store. Both EB-5 investors have a half a million dollars apiece, so a million total, and the investment came into the store as equity, uh, limited voting equity shares, B-class shares. We also decided that since we're doing direct investments and we understand the difficulty versus uh, regional center investments, we decided that we're going to make our offerings uh, a little more attractive to investors. So we're offering a 2% preferred return to our investors and also charging only a $25,000 admi administration fee, which is far less than most regional centers those are charging today. So after we were successful uh, in raising a million dollars for 22nd Street, we moved on to this Lafayette Street store and, and we were uh, also successful in, in placing two investors into the store. And now we look forward to our, our new store. So uh, we're gonna offer investments in both our Boston stores and our two upcoming New York stores, Williamsburg and Rock Center, uh, over the course of the next couple of, of months. What we really decided to do early on is to try and uh, eliminate as much risk as possible from the investor's point of view. So we decided that in, we're not going to take any of the funds in until the stores are open, which basically says to the investor, okay, the store is open, the jobs have been created, um, you can come in, you can, you can sit down and dine with us, you can see the, the, uh, the store, uh, and you won't have to run the risk that for some reason the store doesn't open, whether it's a, an act of God, the, the, the building burns down, or um, something else. So, so what we try to do is make this as attractive as possible to the investor from not only a return point of view, but also eliminating most of the risks that uh, potentially can happen, namely the store never opens and you've already invested in the project, uh, so, so you can rest at night knowing that uh, you've invested in, in, in a business that, that is open and uh, has done what it said it was going to do to create the jobs that we've advertised in the market. So, so that really gives, gives you a, a background of, of uh, you know, how we sort of put this whole EB-5 uh, uh, package together, how we've uh, been successful now in two stores. We're going to have four more stores in the pipeline between now and in April, which um, of course is going to be prior to the next round of uh, legislation, which, flip a coin, we, we don't know, quite honestly, whether uh, Congress is going to increase investments to the million three they're talking about now or not, but um, we will have uh, our projects ready to go uh, uh, early next week so we can uh, start the process and file prior to the next round of legislation uh, becoming law. Good. Uh, David, thank you very much for that. So Sam, Samantha, we have a, an, a tell us about by Chloe. Tell us what are we looking at here? Tell us about the store, the concept for people who may not be familiar with the brand, uh, your, your vision, and what, what we're looking at today. So by Chloe is a 100% uh, vegan, plant-based uh, quick service restaurant where we service between, you know, eight a day. 
know, find a unique way to present vegan food that, you know, wasn't already out there. So by doing it with bright colors, bold designs, you know, a space that didn't necessarily feel vegan, it's sort of like an afterthought versus um, our leading foot to the world. So, you know, as you can see in the space, it's very colorful. Um, you know, we really designed it with restaurant sensibilities, making it feel more like a sit down restaurant versus somewhere that you're going to pick up a burger and grab it to go. Um, I've got some of the uh, our best selling items to show you guys. We have the quinoa taco salad, which is also a big um, hit for social media just because of the colors. And, you know, if you go on our Instagram account, there's just countless amounts of pictures that people are taking. Our sweet potato mac and cheese, which um, we make uh, all of the ingredients from scratch. So the uh, crema that's on top of the salad is made from tofu, the sweet potato, uh, the mac and cheese is made from sweet potatoes, and the parmesan cheese on top is made from almonds, and the bacon, if you will, is made from um, shiitake mushrooms. Um, we have our air baked french fries. We don't fry them, but we bake them in the oven, and um, our guac burger, which is our number one selling item, and we make each of the patties from scratch, um, and they all differ in the different sandwiches that we have. Um, this one's made with sweet potatoes, black beans, um, and then we have our condiments that we make in house as well, our beet ketchup and chipotle aioli, and our best selling dessert item, which is the closest, which is our vegan take on a ho traditional hostess cupcake. So the concept, I want to really, yes. we're in New York City. Yes. You have, uh, consumers have a million choices out there as to where to dine. What makes By Chloe unique? How, how do you attract people in, and, and especially for the meat eaters out there, uh, and I know I was a convert, uh, but the first time I came, I didn't think I would like the vegan food, but you have many people who are not vegan who come in and eat. What, how do you attract them? What, what, what brings them in? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it has a lot to do with the design of the space. You know, when people are walking by, they don't necessarily know it's vegan. They're not, like, really polarized and are like, oh, I, I don't want to go in there because it feels like a place I wouldn't like. You know, nine times out of ten, um, you see people come in here and, they, and they're not quite sure, you know, what they're getting into. And they're like, oh, well, we're already here. We'll try it. And then, you know, they absolutely love it. Um, I think, you know, through social media, we have a huge presence. We have a, you know, a big loyal following. Um, also with the branding, we really wanted something that was eye-catching and unique and just, you know, it's really original. And I think that a lot of people are coming in because they kept seeing these, you know, vibrant photos everywhere of the space and of the food just because it's very photogenic, which is, you know, what we were going for. And I think especially in this day and age, in order to stand out amongst every other brand that's out there, you really need to have a strong identity. And I think that that's something that we really should for um, in the beginning was to have a voice for by Chloe and you know had it be something that was unique to um, all the other offerings out there and I think that our customers you know really appreciate that and it um, and it shows by how much how quickly we gain such a loyal following. I think it's also interesting to note that less than 10% of our client base our customer base is actually vegan Correct. so so the 90% that aren't that come in here just enjoy the food, it, it, the, the fact that it's plant-based, uh, and it's tasty. There's, there's flavor to, to, to every one of our products as opposed to a lot of other vegan offerings, which are fried tofu burgers, for example, or something that's you know, easily uh, replicatable, not, not chef-inspired and not original. And for us, I think that um, it's a unique experience. You really can't get it anywhere else. There's vegan concepts out there, as David was saying, that you know, they basically, you know, just get a frozen burger patty, a vegan burger patty, and then they just microwave it and, you know, charge you $10 for it. You know, we really have um, unique products that no one else can can replicate and have in another location, um, especially not in the same atmosphere as well. And I think that um, it's our message is less about being vegan plant-based. You know, we sort of check a lot of boxes for people. As David said, it's uh, our vegan customers are less than 10%. You know, we get people, we're kosher certified, so we get a lot of people that come in here for that. We get people that are gluten-free, we have gluten-free options. We have people that are allergic to dairy, you know, we don't have any dairy on the menu um, or any meat products. So I think that because, yes, it's vegan, but we do check so many more boxes than just being plant-based that I think our customer base is so much wider. Right, and I've seen some of the reviews where people who come in and, and they don't know what to expect and they order, and they are predominantly. Uh, carnivores, they're, they're meat eaters. Uh, but when they try, for instance, the guac burger, uh, the first time I had it, I couldn't tell it was a, a vegan product. It, I mean, the taste is re really what you're trying to emphasize is that it's good food. It's healthy for for you. It's good for you, and it's fresh. And uh, 
maybe if you, I know some of the viewers can perhaps see in the background the kitchen. Talk about the order process, the, the preparation process, how fresh is so important to you. And you know, for us, when we were designing the menu, it was less about, you know, making the burger taste like a Big Mac or something like that, and just really having great food at an affordable price point, um, and it just being delicious. So um, right now, we have, um, our counter really works where you go up and you place an order, uh, you give them your cell phone number, and we text you when the order's ready between you know, around 10 or 15 or so minutes, depending on how busy we are, you're able to get your order, and you can decide to stay, and you're given trays, or you can take it to go. Um, we've also noticed in a lot of the corporate areas that we've gone into that we just launched on our website an order ahead program where you can place an order, um, come pick it up 15 minutes later, or you can schedule a time. So if you know that you are you know, going to the gym in the area and you want to pick up dinner at 5.30, you can schedule a pickup to pick up your meal at 5.30 and it'll be there ready waiting for you. Um, and with the more locations that we have, the more ability we have to um, really give our customers convenience uh, like that. And it's been super successful. Well, and, and let's talk about the, the location. So right now you have three stores. Uh, talk about in, the- in New, in New York City. And let's talk about issues of the location and who comes to them, the hours. Uh, for people who've never been in a bike club right. store, what can they expect? So our flagship location is on Bleecker and McDougal Street on a, on a very prominent uh, corner. Uh, one of the reasons why we were drawn to that location, um, aside from it being downtown and you know more of a cooler area, was um, how close proximity it was to NYU. Um, and it was definitely, you know, we see this concept, um, you know, five, ten years on every college campus. That would be a dream of ours. So, you know, having um, a direct line to NYU was something that was really important to us. And we see that... Um, that's you know a big percentage of our um, customer base in Bleecker and McDougal Street, uh, and then after that we open on Twenty Second between Fifth and Sixth Avenue, and that's um, you know checks a lot of other boxes um, as well as it being you know a cooler area. There's a lot of young companies in the area. There's a lot of gyms in the area. A lot of residents that live there. So you know you really get a strong flow of traffic throughout the day from the people that are working in the area to the people that live there or the people that are working out in the area. Um, so our 22nd Street store is open for um, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Whereas our Bleecker Street store, which is more of a nightlife area, if you will, we're open um, from uh, 10 on the weekends and 11 during the week till. Um, later at night till like 11 whereas some of our other stores close at 9 because of you know we really try and adapt the hours to the areas that we're in um and then right now we're sitting in our Lafayette store on Lafayette between Spring and Prince in Soho and um our hours right now we're testing out breakfast we open for breakfast at 7 30 here and we're open till 10 p.m at night and on the weekends we open at 9 30 and we're open till 10 p.m at night as well and right. you know, obviously, when you open, you you test out different hours, and then we adjust as necessary. So we're seeing, you know, what works in which locations, and you know what doesn't. And we'll be talking about the payroll and the, and the job creation. But I'm going to say that we picked this time on purpose, kind of between your breakfast and your lunch, because David, as we know, when we've been in the other stores, uh, typically lunchtime gets yeah. very busy, and it would have been harder to film. Uh, at that time, so this is a relatively quiet time. But let's talk about jobs. So EV5, we all know, is about job creation. Uh, talk to us about the direct jobs and how many are usually in each store. Uh, how's that been working out? So we, we plan um, our payroll around a total of about 55 employees, both, both full and part time. The full time employees uh, include management, so each store has. Um, a number of general managers, front of house and back of house managers, uh, as, as well as chefs and, and line preps, and, and then it goes down uh, the line from there. Um, so right now we're, we're at, at 22nd Street and at Lafayette, which are our two EV5 offerings. Um, we've created 30 full-time jobs, direct full-time jobs, so they're all on the payroll of the um, job creating entity. Uh, and that and that will continue as as we uh, think that we've sort of now gotten into a, a bit of a groove where we understand our needs, our payroll needs. Uh, there's also another 25 part-time employees. On top of that, which we completely understand, uh, don't qualify obviously for for EB5. So we're focused uh, primarily on the direct full-time jobs. Uh, so so right now our payrolls are running. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 
uh, 1.1 to 1.3 million dollars uh, on an annualized basis for the stores that we have opened, uh, and, and we see that continuing as we continue to grow out the business um, and, and, and add new locations. So uh, we think this model works incredibly well for for even five because of those direct jobs that that we're going to be able to create and have one of the stores. That we right, and, and in fact, part of what we're doing here today is to verify that the jobs have been created. The nice thing. I would say from an investor standpoint is that uh, their investment doesn't actually typically flow into the job creating entity until the store is operational and then until you open, is that correct? Until the store is open and the jobs are created. So, um, and, and again, what we didn't want to do is, is create more risk for the investor. Um, you know, the investor is doing their due diligence and, and, and relying on us to make sure this business is operating for the next we hope, you know, 50 years, um, but we know the process is going to take five to seven years, and we understand that these businesses have to remain open for, for that period of time, uh, so we've, we've tried to eliminate as much risk as possible, and, and what we thought, um, you know, the, the most obvious is that this store never gets built, and the jobs never get created, but yet the investor has um, taken trust in us and, and has already advanced uh, the funds into our account. So what we've decided is the store is going to be open, all the, all the documents, the paperwork will be done, PPM offerings, subscription limit will be done prior to the store opening. Um, it takes you know some period of time for, for investors to do the due diligence, understand how we've structured the transaction, um, they get comfortable with, with the documents, they can come in and, and visit with us, dine with us in, in any one of our restaurants or come to our offices. In fact, um, the investors, uh, two of the four investors we have, have come into uh, New York City from overseas and, and have spent time with us to, to understand uh, our business and, and understand us. And, and I think that's one of the huge advantages over the regional center. There's no intermediate. You're dealing with us, you're dealing with with the owners and, and developers and curators of this concept, um, you're not dealing with with a, a, a regional center representative. Um, may get back to you in a timely manner, or, or may not. Uh, so by by not taking funds in until the stores actually open, and we are open for business. The cash register is open and ringing. Uh, we believe eliminates a ton of business risk um, for for our investors, and and, and I think. The last thing we want our investors to do is invest, get their money back because the store didn't open, and then have to run around and try and find uh, another easy five project to invest. Right, and and I can say from our standpoint, the transparency is is a huge issue. Uh, obviously, we've seen other projects in the market that uh, both regional center and direct, which have failed because misuse of fund, misappropriation of uh, business, their, business never gets built. The never business opens. never gets built. It, it gets misspent. The, the manager uh, spends the money where they perhaps shouldn't. In this case, it's, it's very transparent. You, they can come in your office. Uh, they can come to the store. They can see what's happening. Part of what we're doing today is an ongoing uh, due diligence and verification that they you have spent the money yeah. according to the plan the jobs have been created. So and this I think it's important too, so the way we've structured each one of our transactions, we as an entity, the ownership entity, the managing member, fully funds 100% of the cost to build the project. Um, and what we do initially is, is we uh, enter into a bridge note with, with the job creating entity from the parent level for the million dollars that the EB5 money is going to replace. So, um, you know, we, we, E Squared owns or manages 28, 29 restaurants around the world now. Um, uh, primarily under the ELT name, that is our fine dining um, uh, brand, as well as others, and now we're uh, in, the, in the fast casual business. Um, so, we, we've been in the restaurant business for, for 25 or 30 years. We understand how to build, open, operate, and, and account for uh, restaurants, which is a huge undertaking. We have 40 people in our corporate offices that take care of accounting, finance, payroll, uh, project management, PR, branding and design. We have uh, five executive chefs on, on, on staff who uh, 
uh, constantly revise our, our recipes uh, and improve our recipes. So uh, we are you know, a full service, fully operating restaurant concern. It's, um, and then that's why we love when people come into our office because uh, they see the depth of, of, of our corporate structure. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we think that what we do bodes incredibly well for being able to, uh, A, have the funds available to, to build out the stores without anybody else's help, um, get the stores open, and, and get them running very efficiently in a very short period of time. Because, quite honestly, one, one of the biggest issues to, to any restaurant is, is labor. Um, and if you can't manage that labor properly, then it's very difficult to have a successful restaurant. You know, food aside, once you have a great idea food-wise, it, it's now, how, how's this business going to operate efficiently? Uh, where, where you can be a great idea food-wise, it, it's now, how, how's this business going to operate efficiently? Uh, where you can 